What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about inherited liver diseases. This is an interesting topic. It'll include three particular types of liver diseases that come by an inherited nature. This includes hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And again, this is part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like these videos, they help you, you really are able to make sense of it. You can support us, and some of the simple ways that you can do that is by hitting the like button, commenting down in the comment section, and subscribe, it goes a long way, it really does. What I really suggest for you, that would be super beneficial for you, is go down in the description box below, click on the link, it'll take you to our website. There, if you become a member, you will have access to amazing notes, great illustrations, quiz questions, that our team has really worked hard to develop for your understanding of these topics. So go check that out. Also, be on the alert. We're making exam prep courses, so keep an eye out for that. And there's so much more to go and peruse on the website. Go check that out, all right? Let's take our time now and go through <clears throat> each one of these three inherited liver diseases. Really, what I want us to get out of it is, obviously, they cause liver disease. We'll talk a little bit about that. I want you to be able to understand the pathophysiology because I really think that it helps you to understand how these patients will present, some of the complications that they'll present with as well as I really think it plays a big role into the diagnostics. So let's talk about this. First one is hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis, what does it really do to? Well, there's two types. There's primary, which is gonna be more of the common type, <clears throat> and that's usually a genetic problem. There's a gene, so here's our liver. We're zooming in on a hepatocyte right here, which is one type of cell out of the liver. There's a gene here, it's called the HFE gene. And what this HFE gene does is it helps to be able to regulate a protein made by the liver called hepcidin. And so whenever patients have a mutation in this HFE gene, so here's their mutation, it alters now the production of a very particular protein called hepcidin. Now that this is mutated, hepcidin is produced in very small amounts because that gene was supposed to control that. Now that hepcidin is produced in these super small amounts, what's the particular problem? Well, hepcidin helps to regulate the modulation of a very specific protein that controls iron movement. One of those proteins is called ferroportin. So it's called ferroportin. And these are these little particular channels that are present on different cells within the body. This ferroportin, what happens is whenever there is less hepcidin, these ferroportin proteins are kind of in some way altered. So we'll put that they are altered in a particular way. What that means is, is that this leads to the actual channels on the GIT to be unregulated. And what happens is any iron, which we're gonna represent here in this black color, that's in the GIT can undesirably and without any kind of hindrance, be massively absorbed into the bloodstream. So there's going to be a massive increase in absor absorption of the iron across the GIT, so of iron. All right, that's one particular thing. So now we're gonna have tons of iron that can actually accumulate with inside of the bloodstream. The second thing, and this is again going to lead to this particular process here, the second thing is that there's also these protein channels which are present on macrophages, and they're also present in the spleen. So not just the GIT, so here we have our GIT that's being altered, here we have our macrophage, and we also have the spleen being altered. Now, what happens here is it kind of stimulates, it leads to uncontrolled release of iron that's naturally stored. You know iron is naturally stored inside the spleen and it's stored inside of macrophages. But if you kind of cause it to now be increased in its release, you'll put a lot of the actual iron from the macrophages and from the spleen into the bloodstream. So now I'm gonna have an increased release of iron. What's the end result? Pretty straightforward here, right guys? That as you release lots of iron from the macrophages in the spleen, you're also going to do what? Increase the iron within the bloodstream. So now there's a lot of iron within the bloodstream. There's increasing amounts of iron. We're gonna put Fe. The problem with that is what iron then goes and does, because it deposits in a bunch of different organs. 
Now, whenever iron is increased in the bloodstream, what happens is your liver has to compensate for it because you got all this iron running through your bloodstream. You shouldn't have that. And so your liver will actually try to increase a bunch of different proteins to compensate for that. And it'll make a lot of what's called ferritin. It'll make a lot of what's called transferrin. And so it'll try to compensate to bind up some of those proteins by really pumping out some of, to compensate for the iron that's free circulating. We don't want this to be freely circulating, so we gotta bind it up. And so it'll make a bunch of different molecules that'll hopefully bind that up. And you'll see these as very helpful lab values. Okay, now what's the downstream effects of high iron within the bloodstream? Well, it can deposit in tissues, and when it goes and it deposits into tissues, like the liver, like the, um, the actual um, heart, like the pancreas and like the skin, it causes free radical reactions. And so in all of these particular scenarios, it's going to increase reactive oxygen species via the Fenton reactions. And if you increase reactive oxygen species, you increase inflammation. And that's what it's gonna do. It's gonna increase the inflammation in all of these particular areas. But one of the other things it's gonna do is it's just gonna deposit into these tissues. When you deposit into these tissues, it causes a couple different complications. So let's talk about the areas that it deposits and then the downstream consequences of that, because this is how they'll present. One is it'll deposit into the liver. And as it deposits into the liver, this will cause hepatotoxicity. Hepatotoxicity, over time, the problem with this disease is that it can be chronic. So it'll continue to occur, continue to occur, continue to occur. So again, this is hepato, Toxicity, sorry about that. So hepatotoxicity is gonna be a really big thing. When this happens over time, this will trigger fibrosis. So the liver will become super fibrotic as a response to this inflammatory injury. As it becomes fibrotic, it then progresses to cirrhosis. And so what will happen over time is that these patients will progress to cirrhosis. And cirrhosis is oftentimes found by a liver injury that is chronic with underlying fibrosis and nodular regeneration, drops in albumin, drops in uh, potential like platelet production, drops in coagulation proteins, all those different things. If you want more information, go watch the cirrhosis lecture. But that's one of the big potential complications here. The other one, it deposits into the myocardium. And so it causes myocardial deposition. And when you cause myocardial deposition, what you do is you make it kind of a little bit more tough and less compliant. And now the ventricles don't want to fill good with blood. And if they don't fill good with blood, there's diastolic dysfunction, which kind of exhibits kind of a heart failure type of capacity. But it's not due to normal causes of heart failure. It's due to an infiltration. And so we call this restrictive cardiomyopathy. So please don't forget this. In some cases, it can cause dilated, but it's more likely to cause this restrictive cardiomyopathy, and to some small degree, it may even cause dilated cardiomyopathy. The last one is it likes to deposit near the islets of Langerhan. And this is the, so if it causes islet deposition, the problem with this is, is the islet cells, these produce insulin. And so now if there's a destruction of these islet cells, there'll be less insulin. And insulin, if there's less of it, it'll lead to glucose levels being high. What's that called whenever glucose levels are high due to insulin deficiencies or insulin problems? Diabetes. And so these can cause diabetes more in a secondary type of manner. So this is a common cause of secondary diabetes. So what we can see is islet deposition, decreasing insulin, hyperglycemia, which can start to ensue, and we'll see secondary diabetes. So watch out for patients with high glucose levels, features of right heart failure, which we see in restrictive cardiomyopathy, and liver disease, okay? Maybe they'll present with jaundice, or ascites, or other complications. And lastly, it can deposit in the skin, and this is really helpful because whenever iron deposits into the skin, it gives it more of a hyperpigmented type of appearance. So hyperpigmentation is another potential finding. So watch out for hyperpigmentation, diabetes, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and cirrhosis in a patient with hemochromatosis. One last thing is yes, by far the most common cause is an HFE gene mutation, but you can see this in secondary diseases. And so just as a quick little aside, this is primary hemochromatosis.
There is a secondary hemochromatosis and it's relatively simple. It's anything that exogenously increases iron overload. What would be a very simple concept of that? Transfusions. And so increasing iron overload and it's usually exogenous. The best example of this would be transfusion. So if someone's getting tons and tons and tons of transfusions, definitely think that if they have high iron levels, along with all of these complications, it could be due to secondary hemochromatosis. All right, Wilson's disease. This one's a really interesting one, happens to be one of my favorite inherited liver diseases, just because it's so interesting. What happens in this problem is, again, we have a hepatocyte here. So this is our cute little hepatocyte. The problem that exists in this hepatocyte is there is a mutation. And this mutation is in a very particular type of protein called the ATP7B protein. And what happens is there's some type of mutation that decreases the amount of this particular protein. So this thing is super mutated, it's altered in some way. Why is that important? Well, naturally, copper is going to be present inside of cells, right? Just like iron is present inside of macrophages and spleens, and even in the liver. But in high amounts of it, it causes hepatotoxicity, restrictive cardiomyopathy, diabetes, and hyperpigmentation. Same thing with copper. We don't want too much copper. And so what happens is we don't want copper to be free, just like we don't want iron to be free. And that's why whenever iron is in a lot of free amounts, our liver tries to compensate and makes lots of transfer and ferritin to bind it up so it's not free. Same thing, ATP7B is supposed to take this copper that's freely circulating and bind it to a protein here. This protein here is called Aposeruloplasmin, Aposeruloplasmin. Now, what happens is that this ATP7B is mutated. So is it going to be able to take copper and bind it with the Aposeruloplasmin? No. And so this process is inhibited. And if that happens, you can't combine copper with this, so you have more free copper building up. The second thing ATP7B does is when you bind the copper to the aposeruloplasmin, it converts it into another protein. So we'll have copper, we'll represent this as these black different dots here, right? These are these black dots. So aposeruloplasmin is the protein with no copper. If we bind it to copper, then it's called ceruloplasmin. So this one is called ceruloplasmin. So here's what I want you to understand. This would be the form that's bound to copper. But because ATP7B is mutated and you don't have this good function, this will not occur. So I want you to think about that. If we can't take copper and bind it to an aposeruloplasmin, we can't make this. So there's going to be low levels of ceruloplasmin, which is actually released into the blood. And aposeruloplasmin, it's gonna be in high amounts because I have never bound this to copper. So we'll have high levels of aposeruloplasmin, and because we never got rid of this, we never took this copper and fused it into this safer form, this is the safe form, copper will build up. There's another thing. Copper is also supposed to be eliminated via the bile. This is our bile duct. So ATP7B helps to take copper and excrete copper into the bile. But if ATP7B is mutated, are you able to do that? No. And so what happens? Copper will build up. The problem is that when copper builds up inside of the hepatocyte, it causes hepatotoxicity, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing is, this copper will then start to move into the bloodstream. And whenever this happens, you'll end up with tons and tons of copper that'll kind of like move around within the bloodstream. So here's our copper in large amounts. Now, what are the potential complications of this? Well, when copper stimulates, I'm sorry, it sits in the liver, it causes some nasty stuff because copper can cause increased free radical reactions. So copper will cause direct injury to the liver because it'll stay in the liver. If it leaks into the bloodstream though, it can go to a very specific area called the Desmond's membrane in the cornea. And then the other area that it likes to deposit in is into the actual central nervous system, particularly the basal ganglia. <clears throat> now, what's the complications here? Copper deposits into the liver, increases free radical 
reactions because it's a free it can be a free radical if there's large amounts of it on its own free bound uh, freely not bound and what will happen is this will increase reactive oxygen species and this will lead to inflammation which will lead to let's see if I can get this right here hepatotoxicity which leads to over time chronic liver injury which leads to cirrhosis Right? So you're going to have injury, 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 which leads to laying down of scar tissue, nodular regeneration, and then we start seeing decreases in liver function and increases in portal hypertension or portal blood pressure. And this is what will lead to the concept of cirrhosis. The other thing is it loves to deposit, we'll just draw it here, it loves to deposit in the cornea. And I'll show you guys a picture of this. It deposits around uh, like the edge there, what's called the Desmond's membrane. And when it does, it causes these really interesting rings uh, called Kaiser Flesher rings. And these are super interesting and usually you'll see this under a very specific type of like light. And so whenever you look in their eyes, one of the big things I want you to remember is do they have cirrhosis, features of decreased liver function and hypertension, portal hypertension? Do they have these golden kind of appearances, these rings around the edges of the cornea and the Desmond's membrane? And lastly, do they deposit into the basal ganglia? And when you deposit into the basal ganglia, you alter a lot of the normal functions of cognition and also primarily movement. And so the basal ganglia is super, super important with movement. And so one of the biggest things is that they start to exhibit movement disorders. And I think some of the best ways of describing this is they can literally have weird types of tremors, like really odd tremors. Some of them are called like winged like bird wing tremors or wing bird tremors. And what, it, what I mean is, is that if you take these patients and have their arms out like this and you leave them out there, they'll start to kind of like have these like flapping tremors or it looks like they're kind of like, they're like a bird. That's one very common feature. Another one is dystonia. So they have kind of like these weird contractions of tongue or other limbs. So watch out for dystonia. And sometimes they can even exhibit Parkinson-like symptoms. And so I would also remember that they can exhibit Parkinson-like symptoms or Parkinsonism. But they can also have cognitive impairment. So look for kind of like issues with the memory as well as potentially depression or psychosis. And so that's a big one to remember is that they can have psychiatric issues as well. And oftentimes this can look like uh, depression. Uh, it can be psychosis and weird worst case scenarios. So watch for increasing in movement disorders and increasing psychiatric issues with worst case scenario psychosis. All right, so now we have a patient who has too much copper or too much iron. What's the last inherited liver disease? The last one is called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The concept behind this one is there is a gene. I don't want you to get too bogged down in comparison. These are the big ones. This one is not as high yield. It's called a PIS gene. And sometimes this one can be mutated. And if this one is mutated and there's very little of this type of gene, what happens is it's supposed to help in the breakdown of a big protein into what's called alpha-1 antitrypsin. So usually what it'll do is it'll take this big protein here and we'll break it down into alpha-1 antitrypsin and release alpha-1 antitrypsin into the bloodstream. But this is kind of impaired, right? And so what happens is you get decreasing amounts of circulating alpha-1 antitrypsin, which I'll write as this, it's kind of like the little shorthand. So there's less amounts of the alpha-1 antitrypsin in, uh, protein with inside of the bloodstream. But there's lots of this protein kind of like weird aggregate that accumulates inside. There's a lot of these like weird polymers. These weird polymers over time can cause issues and destruction of the actual tissue. So here is our alpha-1 antitrypsin, and this is this weird kind of like alpha-1 antitrypsin polymer. This thing can cause destruction of the tissue over time. Now, a big thing to remember with this one is if you have a lot of this polymer, which we'll represent here in this blue color. So I want you to remember, you're gonna have lots of this kind of alpha-1 antitrypsin type of like weird polymer that accumulates in this liver cell. So we'll write it above this. 
increase in the alpha-1 antitrypsin polymer, this will lead to, see if I can get it again, hepatotoxicity. And then again, from chronic inflammation, you'll start to have these patients experiencing things like portal hypertension and decreasing liver function because of all the fibrosis and nodular regeneration that these patients will start to experience, okay? So that's one concept. So I'm gonna bring this one from over here because it's kind of sitting in the hepatocytes. It hasn't left the hepatocytes. Just like copper technically won't leave the hepatocytes, it'll sit inside of it and cause that damage. This is the one that I want you to remember. So we don't have a lot of circulating alpha-1 antitrypsin. So this one's actually really helpful because there's a particular cell, especially inside of our lungs, oh, this is super helpful, and it's called uh, neutrophils. And neutrophils, they make a very specific enzyme that tries to destroy particular tissues, but we're supposed to have a balance on it. We only want sometimes this to happen in certain scenarios when there's foreign invaders or inflammation. We don't want it to happen undesirably. It unfortunately happens undesirably. And it produces this molecule called elastases. Now we're supposed to have a balance of this, all right? We should have a balance. But if there's decreasing alpha-1 at their trypsin, we have no longer a balance on these neutrophils from shutting them down. And so naturally what happens is these neutrophils become hyperactive and they produce multiple elastases because you no longer have this in inhibition. It's released from inhibition. And this causes elastases to be produced in large amounts. And when that goes into the lungs, it destroys some of the tissues in the lungs and it really causes these big poofy asini to form and emphysematous changes to occur in the bottom parts of the lungs. And we call this pan asinar emphysema. So we call this, I don't know why I opened up this one, I got this one right here. This is called pan asinar asinar emphysema. So the big thing to watch out for for this one is a young patient who develops features of COPD. Maybe they develop dyspnea, wheezing, shortness of breath, complications like respiratory failure or pneumothorax, or they develop uh, other kinds of features, particularly like portal hypertension, I'm sorry, uh, pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure, et cetera. In these scenarios in a young patient with COPD and underlying liver disease, you definitely wanna be thinking about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Okay. So with all of that being said, we have now covered all of the inherited liver diseases. We covered the pathophys, the causes, the complications, and a real comparison between these. Now let's go into how to diagnose these. So with that being said, that's a lot to talk about with inherited liver diseases, right? How do I really about, go about having a decision to think that they may have one? Well, oftentimes this will present in a patient who has maybe an elevation in their LFTs. Maybe they have an increase in their AST and their ALT primarily, which suggests that there's a patocellular injury. In the combination of other systemic diseases, I would definitely start to think about inherited liver diseases. For example, if a patient also had emphysema and they were young, I would think this could be alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Let me check an alpha-1 antitrypsin level, and if it's low, I could definitely have a confident degree that it could be alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The only way that I could truly definitively diagnose this is I'd probably need a biopsy to confirm. With that being said, if a patient also presented with diabetes, um, hyperpigmentation, and restrictive cardiomyopathy with LFT elevation, I, that could be hemochromatosis. Let me send off a transfer and saturation. If that's pretty elevated, that means that iron's really heavily bound to transferrin in the bloodstream. If the ferritin levels are elevated, that means that there's a lot of iron bound to ferritin in the cells. And then if the HFE gene is positive, oof, that could have a strong degree of suspicion this is primary hemochromatosis. So a pretty good suspicion, but I'd probably need a biopsy to completely confirm. The last one is if I have Kaiser Flesher rings. So this has got you know copper accumulation that we would see under the slit lamp exam, um, and you would see this kind of like very beautiful gold rings around the uh, the iris, and this is indicative of Kaiser Flesher rings. And this would be on that slit lamp exam. The other thing is I would look for movement disorders, so abnormal what we call choreiform movement, which is this weird kind of jerky movement, as well as if they present with psychotic uh, breaks or psychosis. I really think about Wilson's disease. Now, with this being said, oftentimes they have lots of copper within their body, not just in their liver, so their urinary copper is oftentimes pretty elevated, and we already talked about it. If they don't have the atp 7 b gene, they can't combine copper with apoceruloplasmin, and therefore you can't make ceruloplasmin. So ceruloplasmin levels should be low.
we also can test these patients for the ATP7B gene, but oftentimes you may need a biopsy to confirm that this truly is the disease. So with that being said, we have LFT elevation, we also have other systemic diseases, and maybe we go forward and we test for some of the genes or we look at some of the other potential factors that suggest it's hemochromatosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, or Wilson's disease. How do we treat them? Well, it's actually just kind of replacing some things. For example, in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you give them IV anti-alpha-1 antitrypsin proteins. And sometimes in these patients, they may require liver transplant if they're pretty far gone. The next thing is hemochromatosis. In hemochromatosis, it's really about phlebotomizing these patients. It's about getting the excess iron out of the bloodstream so that it doesn't go and damage further tissues. So phlebotomizing these patients is oftentimes the best way to go here. Sometimes you can use iron chelating agents, but oftentimes it's phlebotomy that's first line. Wilson's disease, it's all about chelating and binding up the copper. And one of the first agents that we oftentimes will go to is something like penicillamine. And that'll help to chelate, bind up the copper and get rid of it out of the body. All right, my friends, that covers inherited liver diseases. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.